All right, triathletes. So in the first video, we talked about a lot of the potential reasons why we might have GI distress during racing. This video, I wanna talk about some of the solutions. And as I said, I like to really think about this in three pillars. So we have things we can do during training, things we can do race week, and things we can do race day. So let's start with the things we do in training. So starting with gut training, I like to use this as an example. Now this is one of the greatest marathoners of all time, Haley Geber Selassie. When he ran a 204 marathon, which is just mind boggling, that's a four minute, 45 second mile for 26 miles. This is what he consumed. So when I add it up, it comes to be around a liter of fluid and over a hundred grams of carbs per hour. Now he's only five foot five and 120 pounds. So there is no way that he could just consume all that without training his gut. So many people don't take anything when they run. And then when they try to do a race, they try to take in gels every 20 minutes or 30 minutes and they maybe get lucky and they're okay, or maybe they have GI distress, or maybe they don't take in enough and they bonk at mile 20 or 22. I can guarantee you there's no way that he could have consumed all this without training his gut on a regular basis to be able to handle that. Thinking back to Kona, up to 125 grams per hour. Well, how do they use more than 60 grams per hour? Well, the key is multiple transportable carbohydrates. That's the term that's used in the scientific research, but basically it means using glucose and fructose or glucose and sucrose or melted dextrin and fructose, some combination of glucose and fructose. Why? Because they use different taxi cabs. So it's as if glucose was using taxis and fructose was using Ubers. You still have that same 60 cab per hour limit for glucose, but you also can get 30 Ubers per hour. And together, you can transport a lot more people, or in this case, carbohydrates. I wanna show you the results from a study to show you just how profound these effects can be. So this study looked at 30 minute time trial performance after two hours of exercise at 77% VO2 max. So that means two hours at moderate intensity, followed by a 30 minute time trial. And during that time, the cyclist consumed either 60 grams per hour of glucose, 75 grams per hour of glucose, 90 grams per hour of glucose and fructose, or 112 grams per hour of glucose and fructose. And that was compared against placebo. And what we see is all of them are better than placebo. These bars show percent improvement versus placebo. So even 75 grams per hour of glucose is 5% better than nothing. But you see that there's a real clear winner and that's 90 grams per hour of glucose and fructose at a two to one mix. So with that, along with many other studies that have been done over the last 10 years or so, our best recommendations on how to fuel are based on time. Okay, so if you're exercising 30 to 75 minutes, you could use a small amount of carbohydrate or just a mouth rinse, and this can be single or MTCs as the multiple transportable carbohydrates. So basically any type of carbohydrates can work. If your exercise is one to two hours, you probably wanna aim for about 30 grams per hour. So that's either one banana or one gel or one bottle of sports drink. All of that will get you around 30 grams per hour. And again, those can be single or multiple types of carbohydrates two to three hour races, so if we're talking about Olympic distance triathlon, 40 to 60 grams per hour should be ideal. And again, any type of carbohydrate, but when we're talking about longer than three hours, and this talk is primarily focused on long distance triathlon, we wanna aim for close to 90 grams per hour, and this will be always using multiple types of carbohydrates. So that should be around 60 grams of glucose per hour and 30 grams of fructose. Now, depending on your fitness level and your intensity that you're exercising at, this will change, as well as the goals of a given training session, but if you're looking for a single recommendation for a competitive triathlete, this would be the best place to start. Now you might say, what about body size? Well, body size actually doesn't really matter that much when it comes to carbohydrate absorption. This shows exogenous carbohydrate oxidation in grams per minute. So that means how much external or ingested carbohydrate can you oxidize or burn? And we see here there's no relation between the ability to do that and body mass, which is along the bottom. Now, I wanna look a little bit closer at a couple of different popular sports drinks. Here we have Scratch, which is pretty commonly used. The ingredients, primarily sugar. So remember that is one glucose and one fructose linked together. And it also contains a relatively high amount of sodium. This label is a little deceptive because it shows for a half a scoop, which is eight ounce or one cup, likely due to the labeling laws. But when we have a bottle most of the time on our bike, it's gonna be 22, 24 ounces. So triple this amount would go in one bottle. I also like to point out Gatorade Endurance. Many of you probably know they recently changed their formula. On the right, we see the old version, which is basically just sugar and salt. On the left, they took the more recent research on these multiple transportable carbohydrates and changed the formula, which I really actually admire them for changing. So they use a combination of sugar, 
maltodextrin and fructose, as well as a high sodium content, to allow these optimal rates of a high carbohydrate oxidation. This is also generally what's found on Ironman courses, and so there's some good reason that you might want to train with this anyway. I also like to point out CarboPro. So this is just glucose with nothing else. So some people see that as a, a selling point. That's okay if we're exercising less than three hours, but as you know, when we get into longer duration, we want to have a mix of carbohydrates. And I've had some very good athletes who've had some very poor race outcomes, in my opinion, largely based on the CarboPro. Of course, they use CarboPro before I worked with them because I certainly would not recommend it. Hammer is one other I wanted to point out. Perpetuum is fairly popular. Their main carbohydrate is maltodextrin. So similar to CarboPro, they're using a single type of carbohydrate. There's a little bit of other carbohydrate in, in here, but it's primarily maltodextrin. And again, we're going to run into these same problems where you're not using both the taxis and the Ubers, you're only using the taxis. There are some supplements that can help us improve our gut health. Probiotics are something that come to mind. Now, the specifics are something that you need to talk about on a one-on-one -on -one basis because it's going to be different depending on the types of symptoms you have and your current diet and a number of things. This is still a relatively new area of research. Even though it's very clear that probiotics have large, profound effects on our health, knowing which probiotic is right for you is still something that needs more research. In the current state of things, anyone that says we can take a, let's say, a fecal sample and then figure out what type of probiotic you should be using, well, that might be a little bit of a stretch right now. Now, prebiotics, this is food for the bacteria. We can take these in supplemental form, but we also get prebiotic fibers when we eat vegetables. So some of the benefit of vegetables is actually that it feeds the good bacteria in our guts and promotes a good, healthy population of bacteria. Glutamine is something that can help to strengthen the gut lining and help with some of the issues associated with heat during racing. Again, this would require an individualized approach for the dosage, the duration, and things like that. And colostrum is something that also shows some promise in improving gut function. Heat acclimation is another really interesting emerging area of research. Now, it's kind of a pain to do, and it's not fun to sit in a really hot room for a long period of time, but it can be quite beneficial not only improving our long-term health, but our short-term athletic performance. I want to show you the results from a couple of interesting studies. First, let's just look at one hour time trial power in hot versus cool environments. So our power, not surprisingly, is going to be lower over the course of an hour in a hot environment compared with cool. Now this study looked at 10 days of cycling in the heat, so 40 degrees Celsius, and they did two by 45 minute sets at 50% intensity with 10 minutes rest. So definitely not high intensity, but it was fairly long periods of cycling in the heat. After that, we see some pretty impressive improvements in performance, both in hot and cool weather. When we look at time trial performance in the hot environment, perhaps not surprisingly, we see improved power output because people are, say, more used to the heat, for lack of a better term. But also, what's really interesting is that they improve in the cool environment as well. One other study looked at 5K running time, again, in hot versus cool environments. And not surprisingly, we see slower running times in hot environments. This study used six days of a 40-minute treadmill run at 65% intensity in temperate conditions, so 18 degrees, basically room temperature, followed immediately by hot water immersion for 40 minutes. So that means the exercise was in regular temperature, and then they just got in very hot water for 40 minutes. And what we see is that 5K time improved not just in the heat, but again in cool conditions. What I think is equally impressive is the 5K time in the heat equaled the pre-intervention 5K time in the cool environment. So while this doesn't speak to the issue of GI distress per se, it's very likely that when your heat tolerance improves, your incidence of GI distress should decrease. So now let's look at race week. And there's a few things that I like to do during race week to help be proactive in terms of reducing issues. So these include a low FODMAP diet, a low fiber diet for the last few days, and carb loading. So race week, you're generally tapering. And so your calorie needs are less. But what I like to do is put people on a low FODMAP diet during that week. So what that is, is the diet that was created for people with IBS, but some recent research has shown that even in people without IBS, they can benefit from following a low FODMAP diet during race week in terms of reducing GI issues on race day. This is something we can talk about on an individual basis, and there's certainly plenty of resources available online, but basically by reducing these certain types of carbohydrates, you can 
basically be proactive about it during the week. Now, also we want to start gradually increasing carbohydrates. People think about the typical carb load. And so when we get to two days before, we want to really increase carbs and we want to lower fiber. I generally say except for beets, celery, radish, and spinach because these are some of the higher nitrate foods. Some people take, might take beet juice or beet powder because there are some performance benefits associated with that. So I don't want to tell you not to have those vegetables during the couple days before a race. But with that said, generally lower fiber, so things like white rice, white potatoes, um, white breads, things like that. Carb loading, I think, is really important, but probably not only for the reasons that you think it is. Yes, we want to top up our gas tank, but also we want to upregulate those taxi cabs. Remember we talked about the taxi cabs that transport the glucose and the fructose? Well, by increasing our intake, we really crank up the absorption of those carbohydrates and make things essentially digested easily and more efficiently. Also, there's some really interesting research that a high carbohydrate diet increases cycling efficiency, basically how much oxygen is needed to pedal a certain power output. So we can assume that translates to swimming and running as well, so carb up. Generally, I aim for about six or seven grams of carbohydrate per kilogram the first few days of the week. Let's say the race is on Sunday. Then slide up to maybe seven grams per kilogram, and then eight maybe nine, maybe up to 10, depending on the person those last few days. Again, this is something that I've covered more in depth in my online course on triathlon nutrition and what I do with individually with people. And now we get to race day, where of course a fueling plan is critical, so you're not doing guesswork out on the course to provide optimal hydration. And then there's a few other tips and tricks that we can use along the way. So to start with a fueling plan, this is a sample of what it might look like for the athletes I work with. We want to figure out exactly how much fluid someone is taking in, how many calories, how much carbohydrate, how much glucose, fructose, and sodium, how that is laid out, when they're taking it, etc. I'd also do this for the run and turn it into a sheet where they can put on their bike exactly what to take in every mile along the way. Now, ice chunks and facial spray, I think these are two really interesting things that most people don't think about or aren't aware of. So if you can remember back to high school chemistry, water requires more energy to be turned from a solid to a liquid than it does just to be heated as a liquid. So how this translates to triathlon is if we consume an ice chunk, it's gonna pull more heat out of our core than if we just consumed cold water on its own. Now obviously, don't choke on the ice, so make sure you bite it enough to figure out how much you need. But if you can get down some of these ice chunks, it'll be better than just drinking cool water on the course. Also, a facial spray. Now this is a little less practical, but interesting nonetheless. So if you're just taking like a spray bottle and misting your face with water, you're gonna feel actually a little bit cooler than you would otherwise. So it's actually something that works on your brain with your perception of heat to some degree along the lines of the way carbohydrate mouth rinse works in that it doesn't go through your GI tract, it just goes directly to your brain. Now speaking of that, mouth rinse is something that many of you may have heard of. It can improve performance in let's say one hour time trials, so where you don't even consume the carbohydrate, you just do it as a mouth rinse. Well, in a long distance triathlon, what if you're towards the end and you just cannot stomach any more carbohydrate? But you know you need a little extra boost. Well, you take a sports drink, Coke or whatever, put it in your mouth, rinse it around for about 10 seconds and spit it out. It doesn't use your GI tract, so there shouldn't be any issues associated with that, but it will give you a little bit of extra boost. The sport of triathlon is amazing. It can be so much fun, but it can also be not very much fun if you're constantly looking for the porta potty or puking your way through a run course. Recent email I just got from someone doing an Ironman. Bottom line, best nutrition for an Ironman I've had. This is number five. Thank you for taking that out of the equation on what was a tough day with nasty headwinds. My job is to make your Ironman experience or triathlon experience or marathon experience better. I want you to perform as good as you can without being bogged down by an upset stomach. Another email from actually the same race from someone else, if it wasn't for your nutrition game plan, I wouldn't have survived the Ironman, no stomach issues. What I'm saying here is you can achieve similar success with this. You do not need to be bogged down by GI distress during your racing. If we just stop and think for a minute, what goes into an Ironman prep? I mean, you have an entry fee, you have the airfare, your hotel, bike transport, all the sports drinks for training and racing, your running shoes, your wetsuit, just the countless hours themselves that you're putting into that. And for someone to just miss out on their nutrition is just really a shame and I really don't want to see that happen to you. A good nutrition plan 
is the difference between finishing like this or like this. Finishing with a smile on your face, as painful as it may have been, is really what I want to help you do. So I appreciate you watching this far. I'm happy to offer you a free 15 minute phone call to talk about your current nutrition. We'll see if you're leaving time on the table, whether it's not fueling enough so that you're bonking at the end of a race, or if you're fueling with the wrong types of things and you're running into GI issues, having to go to the bathroom over and over during the race or something like that. I want you to be able to have the best race experience that you can. And if your nutrition isn't dialed in, that's definitely not happening. Many people I've worked with have tried to dial in their nutrition before with other people, and it just hasn't worked for one reason or another, but this is almost always very solvable, and that's what I do is love solving it. So you can go to eatsleep.fit. You can look around there. There's other blogs. There's videos. There's a course on triathlon nutrition. If you're a self-learner, I'd encourage you to check that out. If you want someone who's done this for a long time with a lot of people to help you out and help you dial in your nutrition, that's what I'm here for eatsleep.fit or you can email me at rd at trifitla.com. Thanks so much. Happy racing.